Hello, lovely subscribers. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 1 of Utopia Talk. And I am joined, as I am always joined, by my good friend Captain Sidaris. Hello, Captain. How are you doing? Hi, Owen. Not bad. A little bit late in the evening, but still motivated to talk about this one. Yes, we'll soldier through. <laughs> oh, yes, we will. So, bit of an odd one, bit of a different one. What did you think? Yeah, definitely a different one. <laughs> um, quite at the start, I basically already mentioned, hey, is there something wrong here? Is the aspect ratio correct? Is the language <laughs> correct? I remember, yeah, you said straight away, is it a bug or is it a feature that it's in 4x3? Yes, no, it's intentional. That's, and I tell you what, that's specifically why I put that little uh, disclaimer up top at the start of the episode. Because um, this was a bit of an odd one for me, because obviously the whole point of my channel and this little weird hobby of mine is to try and wring as much visual quality as possible out of the episodes, uh, the TV shows and, and the films that I stick up on my channel. And there's this one episode of Utopia where evidently they've done their best to make it look like it was shot on Super 8 in the 1970s and transcribed to digital in the worst way possible. So it's full of like curling artifacts and um, massive uh, pixelation on anything that's red. And here's me going, oh, how the hell do I remaster this? <laughs> so, you know, I bumped the resolution up and basically had to let slide anything that I would usually go out of my way to clean up because it's an intentional part of the episode. So did you use Topaz at all? Yes, oh yeah, I did. I did upscaled it. I added some um, uh, of my usual film grain to it to give it a bit more visual sharpness. In fact, there's a couple of weird segments in the episode where they'll do a close-up on someone's face and you can see it looks, it looks considerably sharper than everything else in the episode because Topaz had more to work with and did a, a much better job with it. It's a bit of a mixed bag, this one. But um, yeah, I thought it wouldn't be in the spirit of the show uh, and it would disrupt the artistic vision of the filmmakers if I were to attempt to like, bake, uh, take out the baked-in combing artifacts and the uh, interlacing and... I thought, well, what the hell was... Oh, and there's um, there's ghosting, there's chromatic aberration, there's all kinds of things they've intentionally put in to make it look of its time. So I thought, yeah. I believe in, I believe how in. much time they invest <laughs> to make it bad. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, well, it definitely gave it the feeling of the time, didn't it? I mean, it looked like... I mean, I, w I would say one thing they didn't do is... Um, if you go back to the Super 8 standard, so a lot of um, old... 50s to 70s home movies and things that were shot on that on that standard as well as being obviously lower resolution than even i don't think if you were to scan eight millimeter i don't think it even goes up to 1080p but as well as that um it had a frame rate of i think 18 fps which if you watch it back now looks juddery and jerky as hell which i'm glad they didn't do because that would have really thrown me i might have i might have tried to fix that but... that would definitely be hard to watch here <laughs> yeah yeah, so they haven't really made the decision to make it at least watchable <laughs> from from a modern perspective. So yeah, yeah. But it definitely gave it that aesthetic feel of the time. I think it was it was it was a an excellent decision to make to give us that sensation. And it's, it's just for the one episode. I think we can live with it. But to be honest, I'm of course it's an amazing feeling and everything. But in reality, does it add so much more to the story to the episode? It's a gimmick. It's nice to have, but in reality, after five or ten minutes, you are used to it, and it's. Oh, you then. think they could have done the whole thing where, like, 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 like people certain sometimes do in films, where if it's set in the forties, they start off with a sepia tone and yeah. then slowly bring the color up for the rest of the film, something like that. Could have, I suppose. I mean, I suspect if they were to do, I don't know, this is very unlikely, but a spin-off se series that was set entirely in that period, I doubt they'd shoot the entire series like that. I don't think they'd go that far with it because it's but hard to sell. I, I know so many people <laughs> nowadays. They don't watch anything in the 4x3 ratio. Even if it's upscaled in 1080p, yeah. for example, the uh, TNG, TNG remastered are upscaled, but they don't watch it because it has the borders, the black borders. Yeah, <laughs> come on, guys. Uh, it doesn't bother me so much. I mean, let's face it, the only alternative is to crop it in. And then yeah, which isn't anyway, good. So I'm, I'm always okay with the original aspect ratio. But yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, hell, there are people who don't like to watch anything that's in black and white. Everybody's got their preferences. Definitely, definitely. But I, I find it interesting that uh, 
a producing studio would decide to make it in that style. It's really an odd one because I think you have a little bit here the problem that some part of the audience will turn off. Especially if you think this is the first introduction for a new audience. Because I guess it was on public TV. It was, yes. Yeah. yeah so, um, so potentially there would be some people who only, who only started watching with season two. Yeah, fair enough, because there was. Well, actually, that, that brings us on to another point of something I absolutely love about this episode. Um, is that obviously we ended season one on a cliffhanger. There was about a year's break between seasons. Mm. And so I remember at the time coming back thinking, yes, finally, right, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on? 20 year time jump backwards <laughs> to fill in the backstory rather than to continue the story because obviously we left off with Milner having just shot Jessica in the leg on a roof as a cliffhanger and then I waited a whole year to go right how's that going to resolve and they just didn't <laughs> yeah no mention they don't not even in the last yep. frames nothing yeah nope so I think it's not a motivation of this season of this series it's not a motivation of the filmmakers behind this series to make you comfortable as a viewer. I mean, it's something we've discussed in the past. They go out of their way to make people uncomfortable. It, it's, yeah. <laughs> the entire show is kind of an exercise in uh, in in how much duress can you take? <laughs> you know, will you stick with it? Are you that? Are you motivated enough by the story to find out what will happen next? And I, I kind of admire their guts, to be honest. It works for me. It, it definitely takes guts guts to produce something like this, not yeah. only on the productivity level, but also on the fact that. The new audience doesn't know anything about the previous episodes. They are drawn into this interesting style of the 70s, let's call it that way. Mm -hmm. No, I hear it from you now, I guess there is no other episodes like that. So... Oh, whoops, spoilers, no. No, it's a one-off. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting to have that design choice. And also, not well, only that, also at the beginning, we have uh, multiple time jumps. At the beginning, we are yes. starting basically where he had already developed Janus. And then we explained every, at the beginning basically where they met the first time. Then they jump back, then they jump again back in the uh, <laughs> farther in the future. It was a little bit yeah. uh, timey wimey. <laughs> <laughs> Tiny why I mean, it makes it interesting though. Definitely. I mean, for for us it, it, who, who watched uh, every episode, but for the yeah. new audience, I think it's a yeah, kind of a risky decision to have that uh -huh. at the the not the last episode, but the one before the last episode of a season of a something a, a special. Okay, this works, but as the first episode, it's a little bit strange right. to have that. Kind of. I like it. It's 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 guerrilla filmmaking. They don't give a fuck. Definitely. You're on board or you're not. <laughs> yeah. Especially the first thing I have written down. Oh, I guess in the seventies they also liked brutal stuff. The brutality <laughs> level was <laughs> again <laughs> high, very high. Well, don't forget the seventies was the era of grindhouse cinema. Um, it was the uh, era where the slasher movie first picked up. Oh, well, yeah, they loved a bit of brutality in cinema in the 70s. I think it was the late 70s, early 80s, where the um, British media came up with the term video nasties and started trying to ban films left, right and centre because they were sick of the amount of gore mm -hmm. and violence and things like Cannibal Holocaust and movies like that. So, yeah, that's pretty much on par with the era. <laughs> I, I never heard about that term. Oh, video nasties, yeah. It was um, with, the, with the rise of VHS. Uh, it, it was one of those terms that became popular in the in the media and then got bandied around and then it became a political thing, you know how this happens. And then you had certain political parties saying they'd come down hard on video nasties and other parties saying, oh no, we believe in freedom of expression of the artistic mind. And yeah, it became a whole thing. For, uh, you know how sometimes the media will just cook up a phrase and it becomes a, a, a panic, a moral Definitely. panic within the country. Like All the satanic this. panic would have been a similar time in America. So, All of those yeah. nasty killer games. In, in the exactly media. in the uh, yeah in the in the um, in the mid noughties we had exactly the same thing with uh, computer games yeah it happens something positive very positive about this episode is they managed to real they managed again to find good actors for the child for the children's 
Jessica was um, really unbelievable close to the Edward Jessica. Yeah. And well, I, it was actually one of my notes um, I was going to come to in a bit. Wasn't that an amazing piece of casting for Child Arby, Little Pietri? Yeah, both. Because he, 100%, I don't know, where did they find the kid? Maybe they only shot scenes when he was sleep deprived and it was nearly his bedtime. Because he had Arby's sort of gormless. Yeah, it was down pat. <laughs> unbelievable how good that yeah. was. To be honest, I think that's the best um, child actors in the sense of they show us the previous image of the character. It's yeah. rarely, it's rarely that they find a child who looks exactly or more or less exactly as the adult actor. It, it, yeah, it is quite something, isn't it? I mean, I don't believe it was a certainty when season one of Utopia was being made that there would be a season two. So it's not like they necessarily found that kid and told, his name won't come to me, the guy who plays Arby, to say, act like him. You know, Ar Arby's, Arby's performance in season one will have come first and then they track that boy down. That is, that is astonishing. <laughs> Definitely, this is really nicely done. But um, yeah, you said at the start of the episode, if I, I've got this in the right language, um, I actually had to go out of my way to... So we, we start with um, an Italian newsreel um, and I had to go out of my way to track down a version of the subtitles that had translated that into English. <laughs> because in the subtitles that came with my DVD and several other versions, I f oh, sorry, Blu-ray and several other versions I found online, it just said speaks Italian. <laughs> so cool. I had to go and track down translated subtitles. Um, and the thing about that is that's obviously a newsreel about the uh, assassination of the Italian Prime Minister Aldo Moro, which was a real thing that happened. Um, he was kidnapped by um, political dissidents, a uh, you know, a, 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 effectively a terrorist. Um, organization. Um, they were protesting against the imprisonment of some of uh, of, some, of sixteen people, um, and he and he was kidnapped and he was assassinated. So that raised my first question: there's, there's quite a few real world events that are covered in this episode. These are things that actually happen, and of course they're using them within the story as examples of how far the network are willing to go. And I remember there was some conversation at the time about how distasteful that was. Um, that these are things that had happened in living memory. Should we be making... There's obviously, there's a Three Mile Island um, event. Uh, there was a plane crash they mentioned. Um, that was real. There were quite a few things. Uh, the, the IRA bombings and assassinations, the other assassinations they mentioned, all genuinely happened at the same uh, around this time. So th do we look at this as... I mean, I personally look at this as, wow, it's amazing that they wove that into their story. They picked out these things that actually happened and, and used them in conjunction with each other as if they tell a single narrative. But, yeah, there was conversation at the time. This was in poor taste. What, what, what do you think about that? What's your perspective? A good question, but in general, I don't mind it because we, we couldn't have any World War II movie if we would see it in that direction. <laughs> Well, you could. You could have the World War II movies that Hollywood makes because they've got no connection to um, historical fact at all. Kind of. Uh, there are exceptions, of being, course. Yeah. I'm being facetious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, I'm 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 on, I'm I'm with you there. I, I don't have a problem with. Um, I mean, I guess the argument wasn't so much that um, they were basing their story around real events. It's the fact that they were fictionalizing the background and the motivation behind those events. Which I can see in some way. You could see as making light of events that were potentially tragic or or horrific. Um, but I just can't get past the fact that I think it's an amazing bit of writing <laughs> to tie yeah. these, these real-world elements together into a single Definitely. narrative. Definitely. I, I like the connection plot. here. I really mm. like the connection here. And I would say we, we couldn't watch any Doctor Who episode, any uh, Star Trek episode with time travel. They, they always change a little bit the timeline there and That's play true. around with, with historical facts. And sometimes in a negative way. Yeah. Hey, it's fiction. I don't think there's anything. Yeah. I don't think you should get worked up about fiction. I, Nobody's I claiming this is what actually happened. I also prefer that way. I also prefer that much more compared to uh, using real uh, life politicians who are in office today and mm. use them in media. Because yeah. every time... You, you, have, you have one politician who is 
such an amazing guy or girl. She doesn't do anything wrong. At least in 10, 20 years, there will be some facts which will tell you, mm, maybe she wasn't or he wasn't the best. <laughs> so That's using true. those persons without the historical context, uh, it can come back and bite you later. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'm uh, pissing off again some some fans of Star Trek Discovery, but they did this. They used one real politician as the oh, president really? of awesome. Earth. So that could bite you in the ass in a few years. Ooh, see, I wasn't. I I, I will have seen that episode, so I, I know who you're talking about. But that completely flew over my head because I had no idea who she was. Yeah. So. <laughs> I also didn't know because in Austria, yeah. I don't care and I don't know yeah. anything about uh, American policy, except of the big facts. And yeah, I also was astounded that they do this decision. So history stuff, totally fine with me. Current stuff, eh, a little bit itchy. Not the best idea. Not <laughs> the best idea. You never know what bites you in the ass in 10 years. <laughs> But everything what happened, well, it's already done. Exactly, yeah. I thought it was a little work of genius, personally. I have one point. It was in, in the first lab we saw. Um, they talked about basically killing all the um, mm. scientists. And I thought, shouldn't you talk this in private, not in front of them? <laughs> it was a little bit... <laughs> Well, the um, the don't come in tomorrow. There's going to be a gas leak. Yeah, so. it was a little bit yeah. obvious. Hopefully, nobody can uh, lip read in this group. <laughs> I'm sure they'd probably know if they could. Um, yeah, that was a little bit on the rough side, wasn't it? Speaking of um, Carvel's scientific endeavors, you know when he and his wife um, presented Pietri with a rabbit. Yeah, and we just we had that shot from. From Pietri's perspective, from I was looking at the looking at the two of them, the camera, um, there was just a moment where I think Carl is attempting to look cute and sweet and lovely, um, and he just pulls a perfect Kubrick stare straight down the lens. <laughs> Do you know the Kubrick stare? Yeah. Just, just like this. <laughs> yeah, like thought, no mentioned. wonder the kid screwed up. Yeah, no wonder the kid screwed up. If that's if that's what his dad's like when he's trying to be. Oh, here's little. Here's a lovely rabbit. <laughs> yeah. Like we said, the, the child actors were perfect for the roles. Yeah, yeah it was it was beautifully done. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, w w one of the questions, obviously, as we've covered, I've seen these before, you haven't. Um, I don't remember everything about it, even after having watched them several times. There's a lot to follow um, in the story. And halfway through this episode, I remember thinking, why exactly was he experimenting on Arby, on Pietri, on his, on his son? Um, and then, of course, he explains it half, uh, part way uh, towards the end. Um, he was experimenting them because he was attempting to dampen human aggression. And I thought, well, you did a great job there, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, and he also explained that he uh, want to reverse this. Remember? He said, basically, I, I tried everything yes. to yeah. reverse it. Yeah. And... Yeah. We don't see that. We only no, see, uh, well, it was basically after um, he talked with his wife um, that they, <laughs> that he has problems with rabbits and everything that he doesn't, him, he doesn't find them cute. Yeah. And the next thing we see, I think it was in that order, at least basically he kills the rabbit in front of him. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How does this have anything in the sense of uh, I want to reverse the effect? I'm doing the damn. I, I think, again, it's because we were jumping around in time in the episode, like you said. I, yeah. I think that was him doing the damage, not him attempting to reverse it. That was the early days before Jessica was born. Yeah, it was a little bit <laughs> mix and match. It was a grim scene, though, wasn't it? <laughs> it was, definitely. And much more later when Albi is doing the killing. Oh, with the <laughs> and that one, it looked, I think, God, from the way it was shot and the way the camera pans up onto little little Arby, it looks like he ripped it apart with his teeth. Yeah, I wondered that also. <laughs> oh, Did he eat the rabbit? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, 
the it's it's impressive how they suggest um, with the cinematography, with the shots, with the angles, rather than obviously show you anything too gruesome. I mean, we did see a man get his fingernails pulled out in this one, but you know, <laughs> yeah, that was a bit more detailed than usual, wasn't it? There we go. It's but not a I have show. to say, I always wonder what does this to the child, to the children. Of course, you can tell them as many times as you want to say basically, ah, it's just play, it's not real, you don't hurt the mm. rabbit. I'm not sure how much this is true that we don't do any permanent damage in the long run. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah, you gotta be careful. Definitely. I have one more. Um, during the the birth of Jessica, I wondered, or not during, after it basically, when uh, they told him the wife is dead. Was she killed or did she really die during birth? I wonder if that was Milner yeah. or Leeton, I suppose we should call her at this point. Um, because, yeah, she, they, because this just followed the conversation they'd had in the car. Didn't it? Of um, yeah. her saying, you know, would you like me to do something about her? And then, of course, we saw her kill her own. Was it Tom? Her own um, husband, boyfriend, whatever he was. She gives us that, you know, that <laughs> Milner is a cold blooded killer background. That, um, I don't think we really needed explaining at this point, but at least it shows us the origins of it. It's, this is the, um, the the showing of her crossing those bridges, isn't it? Um, starting down that path how far is she willing to go for what she sees as a justified uh, intention to save us from ourselves in a hundred years time justified yeah that's perfect makes sense everything but the lack of emotion for the husband she at least hinted that she at some level liked at some point in time it was a little bit rough. Oh, something that did make me, th make me think about is um, I, I, I don't th to me at least it wasn't entirely obvious in this episode. Um, if I think I think it was Tom, her her husband boyfriend um, was actually ill with something, or if he was just an alcoholic. Yeah, that wasn't really clear I, for me either. Because do you remember a, a few episodes ago when Milner was trying to prove that she was on the side of our guys, um, Becky, Ian, and the lot. Um, she introduced them to her dying son, who she said, who she told Becky has Deal Syndrome. So we also know that Deal Syndrome was created, genetically engineered by the, what are they called? The network. The network. And that they did it specifically to see if they could create something hereditary, inheritable. So then I started wondering, well, did Milner have a son? Did, did this guy have deals? Did she have a son with him? Or was the son in the previous episode something she just made up to get on the good side anyway? Because let's face it, she was meant to sit there with her son and die, and then she turned up later and rescued them. Yeah. I'm just getting it a little is. lost now. So, yeah. <laughs> well, we have five more episodes. At this point, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And maybe I'm just forgetting <laughs> something that gets uh, covered later. But if not, if it's left yeah. ambiguous... Uh, we can just fill it with our own headcanon. Yeah. There are so many twists and turns. I don't think it'll affect the overall outcome. No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think another good one. I enjoyed that one. It was um, another one of my favorites in terms of really filling in some backstory. Yeah, the backstory of, was for um, us fans really good. Yeah. But for newcomers, <laughs> I wouldn't have liked the episode. I think if yeah, this would enough. be the introduction of the series, it would be too hard, too brutal, too soon. Well, that's true, because this is from an era before streaming. So, yeah. If you hadn't seen the first season, it's not like you could go and look it up on Netflix. Especially or Amazon Prime if you anything, consider yeah. also the, the many, many, many time jumps we had in these episodes. Mm. For a newcomer, it's too hard. If you have only the brutality, you can say, well, it's the, the format and... Uh, you basically know when you buy the, the cover of the, the Blu-ray, you know what you're getting into it. Okay. But having 
addition, the time charms having um, the multi-dimensional uh, characters here already, it would be a hard selling point for yeah. a network. Yeah, fair enough. So yeah, this is kind of intended for returning viewers only. Yeah, I can see your point. But as a returning viewer, definitely an amazing episode, especially yeah. the the level of detail to recreate this time era. I always wonder how how they manage that sometimes to find so many old items <laughs> from that time period. Ugly, ugly furniture. God, the seventies yeah. was ugly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm good there, Cap. Because like as you said right at the top, it's a late night one tonight. So definitely one. Should we wrap it up until the next one? Yep. See you around. All right. Bye, everybody. Cheers, Captain. And so long, lovely subscribers. <laughs>